Steve is a past president of the World War One Historical Association, and he's a five-time winner of the League of World War One Aviation Historians Cooper and Williams Awards for Excellence in Aviation History. So it's the equivalent of our Mark Lax Award. Uh, he and his father, Alan, published the English translation of René Martel's 1939 history of French aerial bombing under the title French Strategic and Tactical Bombardment Forces of World War I. And uh, if anyone's looking for it, it's from Scareco Press and printed in 2007. Uh, Steve, he's a retired statistician and CIA analyst, analyst with extensive counter narcotics experience in Latin America and Southeast Asia. All the fun spots of the world. Um, is yes. probably, as far as we know, uh, the only speaker we've ever had with experience in harvesting op opium poppies. So um, perhaps later on we can get a few tips and um, if anyone's got some growing in their backyard. So on that, we know who he is. Now we'll hear what he's got to say. Steve? <laughs> okay, let's, let's see if I can get this started. Uh... That's looking good. Okay. It should look better in a second. There we are. Okay. Excellent. Uh, um, okay. Um, no. All right. Uh, okay. I'm I'm still uh, okay. Let's see. Uh, do I've lost those of you who? Uh, oh, there we are. Okay, all right. Is it is it is it working? Okay, Steve. I'm still on on. on yes, I'm. I'm just. Music. I'm just. Uh, um, There we are. Okay. Um, there, as happened during the practice, there was this there was this bar that came up on my screen that that blocked part of it, and I had to. And in trying to get rid of it, I got rid of all the people, um, and uh, and so I was I was fussing with that to try to get it to work. So okay. So my my topic now that I now that I finally have the PowerPoint up is unfulfilled nightmares of World War I aerial bombing, which is a history of events that didn't happen. Um, what you're seeing there in the uh, in the picture is my favorite poster from the First World War. This is uh, um, a United States Liberty Loan poster. It shows uh, New York City in flames with um, the Statue of Liberty decapitated um, I think if you could see the arrow, you can see where the statue is decapitated. Um, and there are airplanes flying overhead and enemy submarines in the harbor. Um, and the um, uh, I, what the poster says is that liberty shall not perish from the earth by liberty bonds. And since we're going to talk about the possibility of bombing New York City, that was what I wanted to use for the opening slide. So since we're going to talk about things that have never happened, rather than giving you an outline, I, I thought I would give you some headlines that were never printed. Um, Kaiser killed in air raid, 1915. Zeppelins dropped plague germs on British ports. Huns dropped poison gas on Paris and London. England withdraws from war in wake of ZEP attacks. London firestorm kills thousands. New York City attacked. Paris firebombed. Paris Hilton burned out. In the United States, they find that funny. Um, Germany violates armistice. Berlin bombed. All right, so these are the topics that we're going to discuss um, tonight. Actually, <laughs> this afternoon, where, where you are. Our first topic is going to be victory through air power, um, which 
in the pre-atomic era really means having enough bombers of the right type um, to bring victory. Um, our, our first candidate for, um, for fooling himself about the power of air power is uh, forgotten Capitan Peter Strasser, who was the head of the German Naval Airship Division. Um, he sent a memo to his boss in August 1916, um, saying the performance of the big airships has reinforced my conviction that England can be overcome by, air, by means of airships through increasingly extensive destruction of cities, factory complexes, dockyards, harbor works, railroads, etc. Airships offer a certain means of victoriously ending the war. He wanted the German Navy to build more airships. Um, because so far they had been so successful in, uh, in destroying infrastructure in, in England. Um, he was fooling himself. Um, and a lot of the reason was that the, uh, the British government didn't allow the publication of details of uh, Zeppelin raids. And so they didn't really know um, what they had destroyed and what they hadn't destroyed. Um, when the Zeppelins went over and, and came back and gave very optimistic reports of things that they bombed. Um, also, if you'll note the date, uh, Peter Strasser sent this note on the 10th of August, 1916. Three weeks later, um, the first airship was shot down over England by um, RFC pilot uh, William Leaf Robinson. Um, who was using a combination of explosive and incendiary machine gun bullets to bring down the shoot a airship, airship, the SL-11. SL um, at that point, the British started shooting down one airship after another. And within a couple of months, um, it was clear to any objective observer that the German airships were, um, were, more, were a greater threat to their own crews than they were to the, to the people in Britain. The next person we're gonna talk about is Colonel Edouard Barre, who was the head of the French Air Service at the time. Um, uh, that's him on the left, uh, walking with General Joffre. Um, in October 1916, he advocated immediate reprisals on German cities for every Zeppelin raid, presum presumably against Paris, against, against England, um, and every sub outrage. Um, think the Lusitania, for example. He believed that the end of the war could be achieved by effective bombing of, uh, of German cities. It, uh, it, it did not happen. It would not have happened. Our next candidate is a member of the French Chamber of Deputies, um, the parliamentarian Pierre Etienne Flandin. And he recommended in an August 1915, 1915 report um, that the French government get 750 Paul Schmidt bombers and use them to attack Essen. There's a picture of the uh, of that that bomber itself. It's actually sort of ugly, um, but he felt that by dropping 1,500 bombs on um, on the center of Germany's arm in, arms industry, that that would bring an end to the war. The problem was the bombers had not been built yet. Once they were built, they could never have reached Essen, and ultimately they were terrible airplanes. Um, the French Air Force. Uh, put these out in the field in, uh, in 1917. And, um, and then when they realized how lousy they were as bombers, um, they, uh, they, tried as hard, they tried hard to re replace them as soon as possible with, um, with SOP with one and a half strutters. Uh, the French um, built SOP with one and a half strutters under license. Um, and in fact, they actually built more the French built more one and a half strutters than the British did over the course of the war because they used them extensively for bombing and uh, observation um, uh, through from 1916 
uh, throughout 1917. Okay, now all three of the people that we've talked about, you can at least cut them some slack because they couldn't foretell the future. Um, we have here with Sir Frederick Sykes, um, we have an incredible amount of hubris um, in that he wrote in 1942, um, when he should have known better, that if the British government had devoted 500 independent force bombers just to attacking German industry and not, not wasting it on supporting the army, you know, that's silly. Um, undoubtedly, the war would have ended by the summer of 1918. Um, so victory through air power was not attained in World War I, um, but it was later attained uh, against Japan in World War II and in NATO's war against Kosovo, I'm sorry, against Yugoslavia over Kosovo in 1999. My definition here for victory through air power um, is, that, is that the enemy government throws in the towel even when there are no ground troops occupying any of their, any of their territory that it was simply air power that forced them to, uh, to uh, give up. Our next topic is the attempts to kill the Kaiser with aerial bombs. Um, this is something that I wrote about in the 1418 journal in uh, 2007, I think. Um, and, uh, and it was something that, uh, that both the French and the British made several attempts at doing. Um, they tried to kill the Kaiser from the air in Belgium, in France, and in Turkey. Um, and actually, they came even closer by accident than they did um, than they did intentionally, uh, yeah, because working. they uh, uh, they they missed his train only by by uh, by a few hours in Germany when they were bombing German rail stations. Um, Number 55 squadron, which was the best of, uh, of the bombing squadrons in the independent force, was the most effective, um, bombed the Mannheim rail station on Christmas Eve, 1917. Um, they just missed the Kaiser. Um, and then again, they bombed Met Sablone rail station on the 17th of May, 1918. Uh, but German air defenses warned the Kaiser that there were, there were planes about. And so they stopped his train and, uh, and uh, kept him from going into Metz. Um, there were actually a lot of troops that were on the ground waiting for him to happen at the Metz rail station who were killed and wounded. One of the things that's interesting about this is that the Kaiser was actually more careful of his British royal cousins um, because he forbade Zeppelin raids near royal palaces or locations where they were, where they were meeting. Um, one of the attempts uh, to kill the Kaiser in, uh, in Belgium um, took place on the 24th of July, 1915. There was a, um, a Belgian nurse who was a, uh, named Martha Kanakert, um, who was uh, passing information to, uh, to British intelligence. And, um, and she was able to learn the date of the Kaiser's inspection trip to, uh, to, to uh, Roulet in, in Belgium. Um, according to her memoirs, um, she was able to wheedle the information from a uh, from, a, from an amorous German colonel who was um, trying to um, be with her in Brussels. And, uh, and according to her book, she got the information from him and was able to, uh, to get out with the information and her virtue, in case you were worried. Um, the, uh, the visit of the Kaiser at this, uh, at this time was, uh, was canceled at the last minute because in a case of, of the left hand not knowing what the right hand was doing, um, there had been some British uh, Royal Flying Corps units that were, that were bombing in the area uh, in, in recent weeks. And so because of that, the, uh, the Kaiser's trip was canceled. 
Um, Martin McKenna's story um, was uh, actually made into a, into a British film called I Was a Spy. It's also the name of her autobiography. Uh, and, and it was made in 1933. And you can probably still get it on video. I, I own a copy on video. Um, she was later found out by the Germans to be a spy. She had been caught, she was imprisoned, but for some reason she was never executed. Um, and she doesn't, I don't, based on, uh, based on her autobiography, I don't think she, know, she knew why she wasn't killed. Um, uh, but, but I suspect that, that uh, since she was working in a German hospital in Belgium, taking care of wounded German soldiers, she had been given a medal by the King of Württemberg, one of the, one of the kingdoms in the uh, German empire uh, for her work in, in uh, saving the lives of German soldiers. And my guess is that the German army just found it too embarrassing to, um, to be executing a woman who had been given a medal by one of the kings of the German empire. That's my guess. <clears throat> Uh, there was an attempt in Turkey um, on, uh, in October 1917. Uh, the Royal Naval Air Service got word that the Kaiser would be visiting uh, Gallipoli town uh, and or Chinakoli, Turkey. Um, in, my, uh, in my trip to uh, my battlefield tour of uh, Gallipoli in 2014, we stayed in Chinakoli. It is a nice little town if you ever get the opportunity. It's a nice, nice place to stay. Um, so the uh, Royal Naval Air Service was based at Mudros, which was about 55 miles from Chinakali. And there was actually a gale. They had gale force winds at the time some officer sent out at least eight aircraft to bomb those two towns, just in the hope they'd catch the Kaiser there. Um, Nothing came of the bombing attempt except that two of the Royal Naval Air Service crews were taken prisoner. Okay, the next thing we're going to look at that didn't happen is the plans to bomb Berlin. I found this very nice picture of um, of the uh, uh, of the Brandenburg Gate in Berlin with a. Uh, with a Zeppelin uh, flying overhead. This is a pre-war picture. Um, and it turns out that both the British and the French had plans to bomb Berlin. Uh, at the time of the armistice, Britain's ind independent force had three separate plans for hitting Berlin. And they were actually within days of doing so. If it had taken longer to nail down the armistice, they might've bombed Berlin in November, 1918. At the same time, the French were trying to develop several different types of bombers that had the range to reach Berlin. So, um, so these are the three independent force plans. I'm gonna talk first about the one in turquoise um, of the Handley Page V-1500 bomber flying from Norfolk in England to, uh, to Berlin and then, and then escaping to Nancy. Um, the second plan in uh, yellow is, uh, is that of uh, 216 Squadron, which was part of the independent force uh, flying uh, Handley Page 0400s. Um, they wanted to base some of those in Prague and where they could have hit Berlin easily. Um, the third plan in white was a plan of desperation at the last second to try and get an airplane over Berlin and drop bombs on it. So I'm gonna go through those and talk about them. Um, the V-1500 was an incredible aircraft. I mean, this, this has gotta be one of the most outstanding aircraft um, ever developed during, during World War I, you know, right up there with the German Stocken bombers, um, the Italian Caproni planes, things like that. Um, this, plane and, and you, you can see the size of it here. This is much bigger than the, uh, than the Handley Page 0400. Um, it had been in development since 1917 with the idea of hitting Berlin, um, but it had a number of problems that, that delayed it being completed. 
Um, as, as November 1918 approached, um, the air ministry got wind that, that Trenchard wanted to go bomb Berlin just on his own, on his own authority. Um, and they weren't really happy about that. Uh, and so they outmaneuvered him and they wouldn't allow the mission just before the armistice. Remember that this was based in, in, in Britain itself. Um, and so, uh, so the air ministry told, told the, uh, the people who had the, uh, the two V 1500s that they simply couldn't take off. Um, once the armistice was in place, however, um, uh, this group stayed, uh, uh, 166 squadron, they stayed ready, um, to, uh, uh, to attack Berlin on, uh, for two weeks after the armistice, just in case the Germans broke the armistice. You'll remember that the armistice was not a peace treaty. It was a ceasefire. And everybody was really expecting that, that, uh, Germany, everybody in the, you know, in the Royal Air Force was expecting that Germany might break the, might break the uh, peace treaty, might break the uh, ceasefire. The next plan um, came about when on the 3rd of November, 1918, the Austro-Hungarian Empire um, asked for an armistice. And so they got the idea that they could send um, uh, 200, 216 squadron Handley pages to um, uh, to Prague and by train. Um, well, send the people and the and the uh, supplies by train, um, and and from that point uh, reach Berlin. What they wanted to do was establish an airfield north of the city and attack Berlin with uh, six Handley pages until they ran out of bombs or petrol. Um, they had uh, ready to go on this train a team of 74 men with rations for six weeks and 300 112 pound bombs. Um, but just before they left France, the armistice was signed and so it, it didn't happen. They figured um, that they were probably 10 days away from hitting Berlin at that point. There was something I wanted to say about the V-1500 that I had not, that I had missed. Um, these planes could fly a thousand miles um, and they could carry a ton of bombs. So they were essentially equivalent to a, um, a, a squadron of single engine day bombers, just in terms of, of the uh, munitions they could deliver. Um, yeah. And, and now we get to Trenchard's plan of desperation. Uh, there was, uh, he wanted to hit Berlin in the worst way. Um, and, uh, um, and so he ordered one Handley Page 0400 to bomb Berlin from Nancy and, um, uh, and, and then return to, uh, to Prague. Um, but it almost certainly didn't have the range to get back. Uh, unfortunately, the order was countermanded within hours. Uh, truth in advertising here, um, the pictures that I have of the Handley Page 0400s, when I talk about 0400s, these are pictures of um, 0100s, um, partly because it's a wonderful shot of one coming in for a landing, and I just couldn't resist the, the, the beauty of the photograph and this other one that showed the, uh, the scale of it with the people in it, it showed it very well. The French had efforts to reach Berlin. Um, and in fact, in June, 1916, Sioux Lieutenant Ansam Marshall dropped leaflets on Berlin. Um, I've never been entirely clear on what the idea of this was. It was, it was like, it was a, some sort of propaganda mission or something to, um, uh, to fly over Berlin and drop leaflets on it instead of bombs. Um, his plan was to fly over Berlin. He, he left from, from France to fly over Berlin, drop the leaflets, and then fly to Russia, their ally, and, uh, and land there. Unfortunately for, uh, for him, he had engine trouble and was captured by the Austrian army. 
before he could get to Russia. But this, this mission, which was fairly well known, um, caused um, a lot of uh, pilots to want to bomb Berlin uh, from stripped down airplanes with, with tiny bomb loads. Um, and I mean, you, you can almost imagine, you've got pilots who are 18, 20, 22 years of age. They've got more testosterone than brains perhaps. Um, and, uh, and, and the high command over and over again had to refuse people permission of doing this because it was stupid. It would accomplish nothing to drop a few bombs on Berlin. Um, and, uh, and, and all it would likely do would be to waste pilots and airplanes. Um, they did uh, modify uh, a Breguet 14 bomber. Um, and actually, you can see some Breguet 14 bombers over my shoulder here. Um, it, uh, they did modify some so that they had, um, so they only carried a pilot, didn't carry a gunner. Uh, or bombardier, and um, and that way it could carry enough petrol to get to Ber Berlin. Um, but it's still, you know, that once once they finished designing it, they realized that it wasn't really carrying enough bombs to be worthwhile, and couldn't defend itself. So so they gave up on that idea. Um, by late 1918, the the French were were trying to get aircraft designed. Uh, that would that would reach Berlin, um, and so they had contracts out for eight different aircraft. Um, the best of the group was the Quadrone C-23, which is shown here, uh, but unfortunately for them, it did not reach the front by the time of the armistice. Uh, it was, however, uh, it was, however, useful for the French's uh, for the French um, uh, post-war air force. And so it, it ultimately saw a lot of service then. So Berlin was not bombed during World War I, uh, but it was bombed in World War II. Uh, it was bombed for the first time by the French Navy on the 7th of June, 1940. Um, the French Navy had a number of, um, uh, let's see, Farman transatlantic cargo planes. One of them was named the Jules Verne. Um, these were for, for ferrying cargo back and forth across the Atlantic, uh, primarily to Brazil, as I understand it. Um, and, uh, and they converted one of them into a bomber. And so it flew around the Netherlands and then um, attacked Berlin from the north, coming in from the, uh, from the North Sea. Um, it did a little bit of damage, but uh, mainly the Germans were able to cover it up because they controlled all the newspapers and, and, and that sort of thing. Um, if Wikipedia can be believed, uh, Germany was bombed a total of 364 times during World War II. Our next topic is bombing civilians with poison gas. Um, there's this real lurid illustration um, that was published reportedly in the London Illustrated News in 1930, and it was reprinted from a German, from a German newspaper. Um, I say lurid because it not only has you know, people lying dead in the streets, but you've got a family in the foreground, father, mother, and child, and the mother has an incredibly short skirt. Um, you know, it's just, it, it's just weird. Um, If you were to look at British, French, and German air raid posters for their civilians to, to warn them about, about being bombed from the air, um, the French and British posters certainly have being bombed with poison gas bombs as a possibility. Um, the German ones seem to, but I'm not entirely certain. Um, I, for, for example, I'm, I'm quoting here in, in the yellow box, from um, air raid posters that were um, air raid poster instructions that were in the city of Neustadt. Um, and so it talks about, you know, avoid all contact of body or clothing with liquids from bombs, avoid inhaling gases, things like that. Um, it, that would, would sound like it was a slam dunk that this is, um, that they're warning people against poison gas bombs 
Um, but, uh, but actually at that point, the French were using their gros on bombs, which were a mixture of gasoline and hydrogen peroxide. Um, and so they were liquid on the inside. And so they may be referring to those. Um, but uh, uh, so it's, it's, it's possible that they were warning their civilians about poison gas bombs. The French certainly did. Um, in this French poster from uh, 1917, um, they talk about um, aerial bombardments with explosive incendiary or asphyxiating shells. Um, you know, closing up doors and windows so you don't so you don't get any asphyxiating gases indoors. Get away from places where asphyxiating bombs are fallen. The French are definitely concerned about poison gas bombs being dropped on civilians. Um, it was the same with the British um, on this broadside police warning in London: what to do when the zeppelins come in 1915. They wrote, all doors and windows on the lower floor should be closed to prevent the admission of noxious gases. An indication that poison gas is being used will be that a peculiar and irritating smell may be noticed following on the dropping of the bomb. So what all this means is that every country knew that it would be very easy to turn poison gas artillery shells into bombs but nobody did. And, and I imagine it was because, um, you know, this, this was letting the genie out of the bottle. Um, if, if, if you dropped poison gas bombs on France, they would certainly, do, they would certainly drop them on you. Uh, and so I think for that reason, it was never done. I do wanna point out that, that uh, even the United States got involved in thoughts about poison gas bombs. Um, in uh, Billy Mitchell's memoirs uh, on page 286, he wrote, we had all preparations complete to carry the war into the heart of Germany in the spring of 1919. The air weapons that would have been used would have caused untold sufferings. Chemical weapons most certainly would have been brought into play. Gases for destroying cattle and sheep and incendiary projectiles for burning the crops and forests. So poison gas was not used, poison gas bombs, aerial bombs, were not used against civilians in World War I. However, they were used after World War I. Um, and there's, there's, actually, um, there's actually some problems with the sources here. And so I, I want you to understand this. Um, Nick, Nicholas Rankin, in his book, Telegram from Guernica, um, wrote that the British used mustard gas bombs against Afghans and against Pakistanis in the Northwest frontier in 1919. Um, I mark this as reportedly because there's no footnotes. There's no details. It's, it's like, you know, <clears throat> this is something I found in one book, um, which is not substantiated. Uh, and so maybe this happened, maybe it didn't. I, I, really, I really can't tell you. Um, it's a similar thing with uh, Sven Lindquist's A History of Bombing. Um, in 1925, the Spaniards attacked Moroccan villages with mustard gas bombs, reportedly. Um, I also heard that the French attacked Moroccan villages with mustard gas bombs during the Rift Wars um, in the 20s. Uh, but, but again, you know, there's, there's no, there's no footnotes, there's no sources, um, and no details either. I mean, you'd think with enough details, you might, you might start to believe something like this. We do know, however, that in uh, January 1936, the Italians used mustard gas bombs against the Ethiopians. This is well known. Um, and this picture here is a picture of some sort of aerial attack um, not necessarily poison gas. Um, it's probably incendiaries um, uh, and Italian air attack on an Ethiopian village. Our next topic is firestorms. Um, firestorms are, are tornadoes of flame that are started by a number of fires in a small area. 
um, you get rapidly rising heat in the center of the group of fires causing a vacuum. So what it does is it sucks in high winds of cooler air in every direction and, and they spin of course because of the Coriolis effect. And so it feeds a general conflagration. The interesting thing is that the theory of the firestorm was known in 1914 because there had actually been one in a neighborhood in Northwest London in 1897. Um, this firestorm um, was started when, when in, in one area with a lot of, of um, narrow streets and lots of flammable material, lots of trash in the streets. Um, and, uh, and, it, and it just sort of merged together into a firestorm, a tornado of flame. Uh, it was so bad they needed 51 of the 59 units of the Metropolitan Fire Brigade to contain the blaze. And 207 businesses were destroyed or damaged in, in this one fire. So the theory of firestorms was certainly known at the beginning of World War I. And the Germans have interesting things to say about firestorms. Um, the, um, the head of the German Navy, uh, at Alfred von Tirpitz, wrote, single bombs from flying machines are wrong. They are odious when they hit and kill old women. If, however, one could set fire to London in 30 places, then what in a small way is odious would retire before something fine and powerful. Nasty. <clears throat> and then there's also the German children's song about Zeppelins, which was popular around the time of the beginning of the First World War. And two of the lines are, fly, Zeppelin, fly. England shall be destroyed by fire. So we're going to talk about the German attempts to create firestorms. Um, the, uh, the very first Zeppelin raid on London uh, on the night of the 31st of May, 1915, was an incendiary raid. It started 41 fires. Um, and this is in the uh, Stoke Newington neighborhood, uh, this particular raid. And I've actually walked the path of this raid. Uh, and that's my picture of, of the first house that was ever hit by a bomb in, in London. Um, with this particular house, which is the one up here, number one, in the upper right corner of the map, um, the uh, LZ-37, an army zeppelin, dropped, uh, dropped this incendiary bomb that's shown in the insert. Um, it went through the roof and into the rafters and started a fire. Um, the, there were uh, six people in the building, it was Mr. and Mrs. A.E. Lovell, and their two children and a couple of lady, lady visitors. Um, they had some scary moments when the lady visitors, you know, dropped their key in the dark or something, trying to get out of their room. Um, but they got everybody out of the house. Nobody was hurt. And uh, Mr. Lovell uh, bicycled to the local fire brigade. And the local fire brigade came and put out the fire and they actually um, <laughs> saved the bomb, uh, not only saved the house, but they saved the bomb. And that's why there's a picture of it there. It's, it's apparently in some local museum near this neighborhood. Um, when I saw this house, there was no, there was nothing on it that indicated it was, um, you know, I, I mean, I went to the address that was in the book and, and there was nothing in there that, that indicated um, that it was famous in any way. Uh, and, uh, uh, but I've heard that since then, that during the centennial, they, they put a historical marketer on the house for being the first place in London to be hit by an aerial bomb. So um, of all the bombs dropped on London in 1915, 70% of them were incendiaries. But it turns out that lines of incendiary bombs couldn't start firestorms, that you just don't have this, yeah, you, you need essentially a group in a small area to start a tornado of flame. Uh, and although they caused you know, lots of property damage and some deaths and, and, and injuries and things like that, um, it, they were never successful in starting a 
a firestorm with, with their attempts in 1915. The second attempt with incendiaries um, was during the Gotha raids in, um, in the fall of 1917. Um, the Germans by that point had developed new incendiary bombs. Um, and so they were trying them out on London. Uh, the worst attack was on the 6th of December, 1917, and they dropped 267 incendiaries and nine high explosive bombs on London. This started 52 fires, but only two of them were large. Um, 10 years later, there was a, um, a review, a study of the, uh, of the German attacks on Britain um, and uh, the, the German air attacks on Britain. And um, and these were the conclusions um, that were that were written by the by the army major who was doing the report. He said a great deal of time was spent on the design of these incendiary bombs, with such high hopes for their effect on the densely populated London area. The bomb was a complete failure. The sound idea of creating panic and disorder by numbers of fires came to nothing. Um, there was almost a third attempt, but fortunately there wasn't. Um, by early 1918, the British, uh, the British, the Germans developed um, an incendiary bomb that they called the electron bomb. Um, and these were one kilogram magnesium incendiaries, and they would be carried in large numbers, groups of 500 by go to bombers. Um, they could burn for a quarter hour and were not quenched by water. Um, these things were essentially the incendiary, the incendiary bombs that were used during World War II. Um, and they were about the size of a fat road flare. So the Germans were ready to attack London and Paris simultaneously, first in August, and for some reason they didn't, and then again in September 1918. Um, and they expected to devastate large sections of each capital. They planned nightly raids for as long as possible. Um, Ludendorff talks about this in, in his memoirs, um, and he says that they expected to, to recreate the Great Fire of London from 1666, and, uh, but he said they decided not to, uh, to go ahead and attack London and Paris with these incendiary bombs for um, humanitarian reasons. Um, they came very close to, um, uh, to actually starting these raids because by the time the pilots got the orders not to go on these raids, they were already warming up their engines. And so it was just, it was just a very close, uh, close thing that, uh, uh, that kept this from happening to London and Paris in, in September, 1918. Now I talk about Ludendorff's memoirs and how they didn't they didn't do these raids because of humanitarian purposes. I you know far be it from me to be cynical about what somebody writes in their own memoirs, um, but if you look at the dates, you know the Germans were starting to lose the war in August 1918, and they were certainly losing it by September 1918, and all they would have accomplished was pissing off the victors. Um, so it would not have been a good strategy under any circumstances to have attempted these raids. Uh, so there were no firestorm raids during World War I, uh, but of course there were afterwards. Um, the most famous is probably the first, um, the attack on Guernica by the, uh, um, by Germany's Condor, Condor Legion, um, they dropped 100,000 tons of bombs on Guernica. A third of them were incendiaries, two thirds were high explosive. And, and this, what you see in this picture is what you get from that, um, that, that awful catastrophe. Um, <clears throat> in World War II, um, the United States and Britain were doing uh, firestorm raids in, um, uh, in uh, Europe and in Japan. And, and just had, and they just ca caused tremendous casualties. For example, the US raid in Tokyo in 1945 resulted in 83,000 people dying. Oh, 
Okay, our next event that never happened is uh, Zeppelin air raids on New York City. Um, I brought back the fourth Liberty Loan poster. Um, by the way, I own one of those. I'm just really thrilled to, uh, to have an original one of those. Um, and, uh, and on the left, there's a Zeppelin company advertisement that shows, shows uh, one, of the, one of the Zeppelins, either the, the Hindenburg or, um, or the Graf Zeppelin over, over New York City. Peter Strasser, who we've met before, um, was um, presented a plan to uh, to Admiral Reinhard Scheer, the Chief of Naval Operations, to uh, to bomb New York City with the new Zeppelin L seventy that was their most advanced one, and and uh, its two sister ships, which were almost done, the L seventy one and the L seventy two. Um, these were the creme de la creme of, of the Zeppelins. They could, they could, um, uh, they could travel at 70 miles an hour. Just, you know, just phenomenal. Um, and, uh, uh, and so he wanted to bomb New York. He had this plan. Um, Scheer rejected this within 24 hours and may not have even read the written proposal. He might've said, you know, why are we doing this? Um, we got enough trouble with the war in, uh, uh in in on the western front you know why why are we going to spend resources to to attack a city on the other side of the other side of the atlantic um so this was rejected uh and uh sheer died 18 days later when the l70 was shot down in flames off the english coast um so this is again coming from a single source there are, there are a number of books that mention this, but they all seem to come back to um, the 1968 book by Aaron Norman, The Great Air War. And if you look at this, again, there's no footnotes, there's no details. And so I think I, there's enough detail in here that I think it actually happened. The stuff that I have on the screen actually happened, but still I'm a little cautious. I would really prefer to see German records. Um, you know, uh, to be certain that this happened. So this is this is where it stands. Um, but anyway, what we're going to do is we're going to look at this at this question of of bombing um, of bombing New York with zeppelins. Could they do it? Um, you know, what would the effects? What might the effects have been? So so we asked the question: Could the zeppelins have reached New York? Um, and, and I would say it is very likely. Um, uh, a bigger question might be, could they have gotten back? Um, but certainly they could have reached New York. Uh, for one thing, Peter Strasser, who was, who was the head of the German Air, Naval Airship Division, was convinced that the L-70 could go that far. Um, and the L-59, the Africa Zeppelin, um, was, uh, uh, flew from Yamboli, Bulgaria, down to German East Africa to relieve uh, von Leto Vorbeck, um, their commander there who was running a, uh, uh, a guerrilla operation against, against the uh, British forces. Um, but they couldn't find him or something went wrong and they came back. So what happened was the L-59 flew 4,200 miles and when it landed again in Bulgaria, it still had enough fuel to go another 37, 50 miles. So this is the distance one way from Friedrichshafen to Chicago. So certainly the Germans could have reached New York. Um, in March, 1919, the Zeppelin commander Ernst Lehmann, who had been one of um, Count von Zeppelin's first pilots and, and we know him later because he died in Hindenburg. Um, he had a plan in March, 1919 to fly the L-72 to New York City and back if they wouldn't let him land um, to demonstrate peaceful transport uses for airships. They, they were understandably concerned about the existence of the Zeppelin company and their products uh, because the Allied Control Commission was 
you know, dismantling German armaments and things like that. And they thought if we can show that we could, could, could create a transatlantic air passenger system, then, you know, maybe they would let us continue. So they certainly could have reached New York. Would they have been a serious threat? I think the answer is not very likely. Um, I looked at all of the Zeppelin raids that attacked Paris. And I also looked at all at the four worst Zeppelin raids, uh, the four most fatal Zeppelin raids that attacked London and put them on this table. And if, and if you just run down and look at the numbers of people killed, killed and wounded, um, I think that if they had attacked New York City with three Zeppelins, certainly they would have had deaths in the dozens, but probably not in the hundreds. So it, it wouldn't have accomplished very much in terms of, of civilian casualties. Interestingly enough, the US at this point was concerned about airship raids against our coast. Um, the US Army started to be concerned about coastal air raids going back to at least December, 1908. Um, and, and so in, on, on the East Coast, we had uh, forts um, and uh, to protect the ports and things like that. And, um, and so from 1916 to 1917, they placed orders for 160 gun mounts for three inch anti-aircraft guns. They didn't need to buy more three inch guns, but they did need to buy gun mounts so they could elevate them and use them for anti-aircraft um, and aircraft purposes. These deliveries of these gun mounts actually continued into mid 1920 before they had they had gotten all of these all of these forts supplied with with anti-aircraft guns and gun mounts. Okay, now it, it's interesting. Why would they be worried about this in December 1908? And I, I'm convinced the answer is is H. G. Wells's book The War in the Air which features a Zeppelin attacking New York City. Um, <laughs> apparently, they, uh, that book was so well known that, that um, they thought, you know, maybe we should worry about this. So that's, that's my theory. There's, you know, I don't know anything um, for certain from US Army documents or anything like that, but that's my theory. Okay, our last section is on biological weapons. Um, so in September 1916, um, Oberst Oberstadt's Arts Winter, who was a chief medical officer, proposed dropping 100 liter containers of liquid plague cultures from Zeppelins into English ports to infect rats. Um, his boss, the Surgeon General, rejected the idea and said to Winter, um, if we undertake this step, we will no longer be worthy to exist as a nation. Um, and then later, the Kaiser learned about this idea, and he categorically forbade the use of Zeppelins for bacteriological attacks on England. So, you know, once again, the Kaiser looks a little better than, than we might have expected. Um, the British had a biological warfare plan. Um, Lord Tiverton of the Air Ministry in June 1918 recommended dropping plane loads of Colorado potato beetles on German farmland to destroy their potato crops. In, in these pictures, Lord Tiverton is the one wearing the hat. Um, Germany had a problem with Colorado potato beetles and they were finally eradicated in 1877. So this was a serious threat to German um, to German food production. The idea went no further when they realized there was no way they could keep those beetles out of French territory. So closing thoughts. The creation of a new weapon, the bomber, unleashed a wave of creativity among military thinkers on how it might be used. The air power theories and ideas developed during the Great War influenced military thinking into the 21st century. 
I mean, think about this. We've had in the 21st century an attack on New York City. We've had air and drone attacks against Saddam Hussein and terrorists. We've had Assad's uh, regime in Syria dropping chlorine gas on civilians. All of these things, all of these ideas started in World War I. Although there were often technological limits to the ideas developed during World War I, surprisingly, there were also limits to atrocities that nations would commit, even in humanity's worst war up to this point. Sadly, some of these limits were violated just a few years later. I'm thinking uh, especially poison gas on, on civilians. So I'll take your questions. Thank you, Steve. Thank you. I haven't got one at this stage, but um, oh, you've got the photo credits up there. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, gee. So would anybody else like to unmute themselves and ask a question? Or I can unmute you. Yes. Can you hear me? Ah, James Oglethorpe, Three Squadron Association, AFC. Yes, Steve. Uh, thanks so much for the talk. That's uh, <laughs> that's a lot of information that I've never heard before. So that's really fantastic. So uh, what I wanted to ask you, though, was um, my, I, I, not that I've got any expertise in the independent air force, but isn't it true that they had very little effectiveness before the end of the war, that the, the resources they did have weren't actually able to get much um, impact? Um, that's actually the subject of an article that I published back in the 90s. Um, I, I, I did a statistical analysis of the, um, uh, of the targets they bombed and compared that with the British and American bombing surveys that were done after the war that, that cataloged what had happened when the bombs hit the ground. And, and I found, um, as for exactly the reasons that, that, that you suggest, that the, um, uh, that the independent force was really too small to be effective. Um, there, was, there was some talk um, among between American and, and British aviation officers that, um, that the independent force uh, was being used in, in, in the wrong ways, um, that they should have been concentrating on, uh, um, concentrating on eliminating one facility or one industry at a time and then move on to another one instead of just a scatter scatter, scatter shot approach. Um, and I, you know, that was, that was kind of nice in hindsight, I thought, but, um, uh, you know, it's, it's just really hard to, to say that it could have been, it could have become effective with the resources that they had, because they didn't have many, they had, a, they had a total of seven squadrons at the end of the, at the end of the war. And, and during half of that time, they, they were, they had four squadrons or fewer. Uh, and so there just there just were were not enough resources there to to accomplish anything. But, but also, what's your assessment of the improving air defence capability? Both I, I think the Zeppelin raids were discontinued because of air defence, weren't they? For example. Yes. Yes. Um, I don't know if they were discontinued. They weren't smart enough to discontinue them. <laughs> they just kept flying over and being shot down. Um, the the um, uh, I I think one of the one of the important lessons that that was learned in world war one that wasn't remembered in world war ii was how difficult it was for bombers to um to survive against fighters during during the daytime um and and uh now with the zeppelins uh the zeppelins were did so poorly and and the uh the fe2b uh, i'm sorry the uh the be2s did so well that um, uh, that that you know essentially the, the British defenders wiped them out um, mm. and uh, uh, and they should have stopped you know a year earlier than than they did um, just because they were they were not effective and they were they were too dangerous for their own crews. Um, curiously, with the zeppelins, one of one of the things that really got them um, or made them ineffective was the low technology. Um, uh, countermeasure of the blackouts. The Zeppelins were flying lost over, over Britain so much of the time because they couldn't see anything. Um, and, 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 you know, and, and so if, if you're going to be an effective bombing force, you need to know what you're, what you're going to hit. 
um, there's this this wonderful story from I think it's Douglas Robinson's The Zeppelin in Combat, where he where he talks about some Zeppelin is in you know northern England and they're flying over um, you know just fields or something and and they see a light below and they and they drop bombs on it because it's the only light that they, they can see for miles around. They drop bombs on it and they start fires in, in fields. And then another Zeppelin for a long distance off sees those fires and comes over and drops more bombs in the same spot, which is in the middle of nowhere. So yeah, it was, they, they were really um, outclassed. Um, would anybody else like to ask a question? Well, not so much a question, uh, just an observation, uh, if I could. Um, <clears throat> the, the RAF uh, dropped poison gas bombs in North Russia in 1919. Um, if, if you want some information on that, Steve, I can copy it and send it to you. I, yeah, I, I, would, I would be very interested in hearing about that. Yeah, please. Yeah, they weren't terribly effective, but I think that the rationale was that um, it was all right to bomb Bolsheviks, they were only subhuman anyway. <laughs> and they couldn't reprise back. No, <laughs> no, not much chance of it. No, yes. But an excellent talk too. I yeah, learned a lot. It was really good. Thank you. Thank you. Your storms haven't come over yet, Steve, over Virginia. <laughs> No, no, they haven't. That's good. That's really good. Yeah, my my electricity's still on. So yes, yes, <laughs> that's good. That's good. Some more questions, anybody? Yeah. Oh, Des, I can go again. Yeah. Um, Steve, just uh, this is only a comment, really, but you know, you're an older gay slide where you were talking about the winning of World War II with strategic bombing. Yes. Okay, well, there's a bit of contention amongst historians about that because although the Air Force is very much in favour of that logic, um, the Navy had the submarine offensive, which they basically ticked up, you know, the sinking of most of the Japanese, both military and civilian boats. And um, the Soviets also launched their massive invasion into Japanese territory between the first and second atom bombs. And if you read the minutes of the Japanese war cabinet, they were much more concerned about the Soviet invasion than they were about the atom bombs. Interesting. Okay. Yeah. Um, I, 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 was, I was aware that, that around that time, the Soviets had started an, an invasion. Um, but um, I, I, I'd always figured that since they waited, since, since they didn't throw in the towel until two bombs were dropped, that that I thought that was that was probably the uh, the determining factor. Well, uh, depending on which historians you read, there's um, a yes. sort of conspiracy theory that the the date of the Soviet invasion was known. That was uh, exactly three months after the winning of the war in Berlin. You see, so so Stalin shipped all of his divisions right across the Soviet Union on the Trans-Siberian Railway, and the same people attacked the Japanese that had just won the war in Europe. It was wow. a, an enormous army. Uh, uh -huh. And the date that they were going to attack was the 8th, exactly three months after. And this was already known uh, to the Americans. And so there was this, there are historians who say, well, the American bomb program was speeded up in order to get the bomb dropped on the 6th. So that uh, if the Japanese did collapse, then it would be because of the American bomb, not because of the Soviet invasion. Right. So, but as I say, it depends on which historians you read. Yeah, yeah. But, but if you read the statistics on the Russian invasion, it was a very serious invasion. They, they made about 700 kilometers. It was uh, a, a blitzkrieg by real experts by that stage. Wow, wow. They, they got all the way down to the, the border in North Korea. You know, I mean, the, a lot of the future Cold War was all set up by that invasion. So anyway, that's just the point that if you say that there was no ground invasion of the Japanese territory, uh, there, there are examples that army people will, will spin off for you. I have, uh, okay, uh, okay. I have a question. But, it's, it, I'm sorry. Paul Tomatis, yeah. Um, I'd like to show a photograph, uh, Stephen, and, and talk about a, a V1500 um, that okay. I've researched. I, could you drop your, and I'll, I'll, I'll bring my photograph up. 
Oh, yes. Uh, let's see. Um, just out okay, the top. Okay, if I just top try top. to delete yeah. it. Yep. Yeah. Ah, okay. All right. I, th I think I got rid on of it. Share screen, uh, Paul. Can you see that photograph? Yeah. Yes. Um, wow. Now, what we're looking at is a V-1500 in Afghanistan in 1919. And this single aircraft was employed on what might be called um, leadership targets in Kabul. Mm -hmm. And the aircraft flew selected bombing missions into Kabul in May of um, 1919 as part of the Waziristan campaign which was fought primarily by Indian Army and Royal Air Force um, units. And um, the caption for this, which, uh, which I've found in uh, an Imperial War Museum, suggests that this is in fact a, a V-1500. Um, I also understand that uh, due uh, to strategic policy guidance, the Royal Air Force flew air policing operations in Iraq, in Afghanistan. Yes. And uh, in areas of the Northwest frontier. So it's so interesting to hear uh, you talk about this huge aircraft. Any comments, uh, Steve, on what you're seeing there, please? Um, I, well, okay, first, um, I'm I'm sure it's it's a V fifteen hundred, no doubt. Yep. Um, and and now that now that you mention it, I do remember hearing about the um, the attack with I don't remember if it was one or two V fifteen hundreds um, that uh, that uh, scared off somebody who was running Afghanistan. This is a vague memory. I'm sorry, um, but I I read about it years ago, and I, you're absolutely right. Um, and uh, do you know anything about whether they were using gas bombs? No, not in the in the reference material. But I, okay. but I, uh, I, I have, uh, I understand that uh, targeted bombing was undertaken against isolated villages, and ostensibly they were either fire bombed. HE bombed and even uh, attacked with some form of, of gas. But you're quite right to suggest that it's 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 uh, not been uh, documented in in an, in an official sense. Mm -hmm. A lot of these air operations weren't considered military; they were considered policing operations. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I'm 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 aware of the policing operations. Um, in fact, that. My understanding is that pretty much saved the Royal Air Force from being amalgamated back into the Army and the Navy. Um, and uh, um, and so, yeah, I mean, it's it's that part is, is well documented. I, I just haven't seen anything regarding poison gas. So but yeah, that's a great picture. I hadn't seen that before. Here is another picture which is uh, of some interest. Um, and in this book, The Salonica Front, which contains paintings by a British uh, wartime artist and army officer working with Royal Engineers in balloons, um, he was an artist and he painted this picture from the air of what he would call Salonica and what is now Thessaloniki and here, it, he has captured in watercolors a fire which destroyed nearly two thirds of uh, Thessaloniki in 1917. Now it's interesting, not because it was firebombed, but it created such consternation with the British air forces that were in that area that they sent up wood and he painted this scene of um, a city in flames. And when you were talking about, uh, Steve, about whether or not uh, there was um, 
firebombing, I immediately thought of this, but this isn't, this is firing, this is a fire called by, caused by naval gunfire support and, 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 and uh -huh. ignition of, of, of uh, um, sources that, that caused a, a great fire. But um, it's so interesting how things can relate one way or another. Um, mm -hmm. To the others, there are there are several instances of naval gunfire support at Gallipoli from the Royal Navy ships igniting the vegetation on um, the slopes of uh, Gallipoli and even at Suvla. Uh -huh, okay, and and causing a con a conflagration of uh, uh, bushfires, we would call maybe uh, wildfires. Um, uh -huh. You might call them, and and they disrupted. Um, operations. Uh, I'm not quite sure of any other examples. Yeah. Huh. Are we have we got some other questions or contributions? Uh, from just a quick follow on from from Paul, if I may. So thanks, Mark. There is this there is this book called the Hanley Page V1500, which is depicting a painting of it bombing Kabul. Ah, uh, okay. Which is by uh, it's from Ray Rimmels. Oh, and guess what? The author is online here. Uh, are you there, Colin? Colin, he's not Colin, he's online. Colin is Colin somewhere, o. I think. Oh no, yeah, I think he, he was. was. He was. He must, I think he's just fallen off. So Colin O has wrote this uh, in for the uh, data files for Ray Rimmels' data uh -huh. file, and it mentions that they had loads of 112 pound bombs and 20 pound bombs, uh, but they were HE. That's the, that's the, I was just having a quick read as uh, Paul was talking. Not that I wasn't interested in what you were saying, Paul. I was easily trying to do two things at once. <laughs> Not easy, but you know what I mean. Anyway, right. I just thought that was <laughs> okay, thank you. And, and, and I'm assuming you've, you've had a, a read through that one about the independent force. I was trying to look at the conclusions of this book. It's, and, and it's it, wonderful. It, agrees agrees your conclusions. You know, an extra, more aircraft wouldn't have necessarily achieve the result um yeah in the first world war so uh, at least that author you know agrees with you uh, not that i was thinking it was you were going to be different i thought yeah you were on the money an interesting debate about the use of air power but as paul and i are both army people we probably have a slightly biased view we would probably today in our world say the joint effect would probably be the better solution anyway but great talk really appreciate it really Pulling all those Thank extra you. threads together and all the research, amazing. Um, if I might ask one more question, Des, is that? Yeah, yeah. Right? I think Steve, are you okay with that, Steve? You're yes, still, I'm fine. In the land of the uh, living. My eyes are still open. That's good. <laughs> um, the, you mentioned the Billy Mitchell book. Um, has there been any references to his claims that you've found that they were ready? I mean, clearly there were you know, the, the DH-10 Amion bomber, the Vinnie bomber, they were all coming mm -hmm. online. But I'd never heard anything about focusing on destroying forests and crops and other things. Uh, I just, it was purely, have you found any other references to it? I, I haven't, though I really haven't looked. Um, I mean, it's kind of, it's kind of a, uh, well, not speculative, but but uh, yeah, I guess somewhat speculative in that in that he's talking about 1919 and and you know they they never got there while they were still still at war. But I haven't I haven't seen anything else that talked about that. No, no, that's fine. Thank you. And I am intrigued by the painting behind you. I've been trying to work yeah. at. <laughs> is that a this is a Mike fourteen? Yeah, yeah. This is a Mike O'Neill painting. Um, uh -huh. By uh, it's a scene from my book on French bombing. Let's, oh, I got to get. Fantastic. There we are. Yeah. It's the bombing of, uh, of, of Conflans, which was a, uh, uh, a major railroad station that, that uh, a lot of German uh, arms went through it, munitions. Thank you so much. So I, I commissioned him to, uh, to do that years ago. <clears throat> Wonderful, wonderful, wonderful. I um, I would like well, to I'm just show uh, echo, which may be which might might mean that my um, 
uh, uh, connection might be so good. Can everybody still hear me? Yeah. Yes. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Okay. No. No. That's good. Okay. Um, yes, I would. I would. Uh, can I just show? Uh, can I just show four photographs? Yeah. Go um, ahead. Here, I'm going to show four photographs taken by this Australian Army sapper. Um, William uh, Percy, Percy Williamson, who served in France in 1917, uh, and he served with Royal Engineer balloons. And here is a small box brownie photograph of him near Polygon Wood in 1917, in which a uh, Royal engineer's balloon observation balloon is being raised into the air you can see all the supporting equipment underneath here we can see uh, royal engineers uh, and i think a civilian inflating uh, these observation balloons this photograph is only one and a five eighths inches by two inches mm. so these are very small box brownie um uh, they they they're, they're about the same size as a matchbox and here is a remarkable photograph of two australians watching a a royal engineer observation balloon under aerial attack by german aircraft and on the back of the photograph it says two of our chaps watching fritch selling a shelling a balloon from Cafe Belge. Now, Cafe Belge was a nickname they gave to their dugouts where they were um, living. No one will have ever seen these photographs before. And um, I researched World War I, and I'm speaking on this subject next weekend at the War Memorial. That's why I can't come to the, to the lunch. But um, it's remarkable what pops up about the great war and aviation mm. thank you thank you paul um steve you're probably aware that paul's the chairman of the western front association australia and um uh and um and james oglethorpe who asked a question before is the editor of the uh, um uh, three squadron australian flying corps uh, journal and website yes that right, James? Yeah. <laughs> yep. And yeah. Um, I, I used to be um, president of the U.S. branch of the Western Front Association. Who, who was? I was. Oh, you were. Congratulations. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> yeah. You left that it's off a, the CV. <laughs> oh, well, yeah, actually, actually, because um, we had uh, we, we had we had two similar organizations in the United States. The, um, the U.S. branch of WFA, and we had the, um, uh, the Great War Society, which was based in San Francisco. And, and these were two groups that were doing essentially the same thing. Um, they were both small, and so we decided to um, unite them and, uh, in, into, into one national organization with, with chapters. And... Um, and in, in order to do this, um, this marriage, um, we had to change our name. We couldn't, we couldn't keep the Western Front Association name. Um, and, uh, uh, and so we became the World War I Historical Association. So I was the last president of the um, WFA US branch and the first president of the World War I Historical Association. Oh, understood. And can I, completely out of left field, if people have got time, just <laughs> ask you one other thing. Last weekend, you went to Kansas City, and we heard this in the practice, but what was there at Kansas City? If you could, I don't think anybody else in Australia and is, is aware of what's there. Do you, do you mind just expanding on that? Not, not at all. Um, the, the National World War I Museum um, the U.S. National World War I Museum is in Kansas City, Missouri. Um, and every time somebody hears that, they think, why isn't it in Washington, D.C.? Um, and, and it turned out that back in 
the 1920s, the people of Kansas City um, raised a, a lot of money. I mean, uh, you know, essentially the equivalent of, of millions of dollars today um, to build this memorial. It's a very large tower. Um, and then in later years, they essentially added a museum. Um, and it's it is a very nice World War World War One museum, um, and it's uh, and I and I would say it's comparable to ones that I'd seen in Europe. Um, they strive very hard to be a World War One museum, not a the United States in World War One museum, um, and uh, and it's it's a it's a great facility. They have a con they have conferences there every year. Um, and, uh, um, and I'm not surprised that nobody's ever heard about it because in the United States, people say the World War One Museum is where, you know, so. Thank you. Thank you. So Thank add you. Kansas City to your tours of the, uh, of the <laughs> United States. It's the museum is well worth it. Their, their website is theworldwar.org as, as okay. if there was only one theworldwar.org um so take take a look at it and, and you'll get some idea it's really uh it's really an amazing facility and every year they do um they do a battlefield tour i mean they you know they didn't during covid but um they've started again uh and uh and we went to verdun um in september right gosh i'm steve uh, didn't didn't yes. the influenza break out in Kansas as well? Um, yes, yes. You, oh, are so you talking that, about that killed 19... more people than World War One? The Spanish flu. Uh, yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. I I'm not sure. I'm not sure where it started in the United States, but it was certainly starting in army camps, someplace. In, in um, Kansas, and then I, I think Kansas went around the world. Um, I'm just looking at Wikipedia here, so it, as good as that okay. is. <laughs> All right. Uh, but of course, it was called the Spanish flu because the Spanish weren't under wartime um, confidentiality. So uh, the Spanish yes. king, I think, yeah. got it. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> very unfair on the poor Spanish. That's right. I think so. Yes. Yeah. But also, very unfair on the pigs because it was a bird flu. But anyway, that's beside the point. <laughs> oh, yes. Yes. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Oh dear, oh dear. Look, I, 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 I we, we've gone well past uh, one and a half hours. I'm, I'm, I'm sorry, Steve. Um, it, it's all right. I, it's questions? been fun. <laughs> That's good. Has anybody got any other questions? Okay. Well, look, we might wind up now. Um, and Steve, thank you very, very much for your fascinating talk and and the sources and the 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 information you've given us is so original and so interesting and. Look, I'm no historian. I knew nothing about the V1500, so there we are. Other, others obviously haven't. Um, I'm amazed at that. And the, um, but again, I, I, these raids that were about to take place or were planned in, in uh, United States on the United States on Berlin, they're 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 just amazing. And but what, of course, it forecasts what their ideas did indeed, sadly, forecast later on is. Uh, all too true, isn't it? Yes. Yeah. Um, okay. Um, Gareth, would you like to move a vote of thanks to um, our oh, no, wonderful speaker? It was, it was fascinating. Um, most illuminating, and I'm sure we will have all enjoyed it. Yeah. So, thank you very much, Steve. And Great. We, we are in your debt. Thank you so Great. much, thank Steve. You much. Thank you. Thank we'll you. be in touch. Thanks we'll for the invitation. No, we're really, really grateful for that. And the, this talk will be up on the... Um, on our Facebook page and website for people to view later. Okay, we'll edit a little bit. Okay. All Thank right. you very okay. much. Okay. Thank you so much. Talk right. to you soon.